In recent times, the clamor for the promotion of good governance and welfare of Nigerians on the principles of freedom, equality, and justice has given rise to the need for a comprehensive review of the 1999 Constitution. In February this year, the Senate heeded this call, announcing the need to once again touch some aspects of the Constitution to bring them in line with current realities. To achieve this aim, the Red Chamber set up a 45-member committee to review and amend the Constitution. The Senate President, Gotswe Lakpabio, explained that the 1999 Constitution needs a review because it contains many issues that need to be put right. Following in tow, the Green Chamber, that is the House of Assembly, constituted a committee to look into various proposals and agitations for the alterations and amendment of the 1999 Constitution, headed by the Deputy Speaker, Benjamin Carlo, with some lawmakers as members. For many Nigerians home and abroad, the news was welcomed with mixed feelings. While many applauded the move of an amendment, others maintain that the 1999 Constitution needs to be replaced in its entirety. Recall that over the years, the Nigerian Constitution since 1960 has been subjected to series of amendments. Experts note that these amendments were necessary to cure various anomalies in the Constitution discovered over time and anomalies that were caused by adopting a constitution that did not resonate with the pluralist state of the ethnicities in Nigeria. Some Nigerians insist that the 1999 constitution does not contain a few provisions which need to be put right. Areas that have been pointed out for amendment over the years include the country's security architecture, public revenue, fiscal federation and revenue allocation, judicial and electoral reforms, traditional institutions, gender-related issues, state creation, state access to mining, among others. How soon should Nigerians expect an amended 1999 constitution and will it meet their expectations? This and more will form the crux of discussions as guests speak to the ongoing constitutional review Shortly. All right, uh, that was Abdul Salam Jibril giving us the background to our conversation. And uh, uh, just a reminder again, it's constitutional amendment. And um, we have uh, our guests right here in the studio. Quickly, introductions Professor Joy Ngozi Ezilo is a senior advocate of Nigeria, Emeritus Dean of Law, University of Nigeria in Soka former Commissioner for Women Affairs and Social Development in Enugu State. She's also founder of Women's Aid Collective and is currently United Nations expert on international fact-finding mission to Sudan. And she's right here with us live in the studio. We'd like to welcome you, Professor Joy Izzyelo. Thank you uh, for being with us this morning. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Nigerians. It's good to have you live in the studio. I, don't, I can't remember when we well, well, have you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we also have, Victor, I think you, you have the. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. We also have uh, Honorable Peter Ibrahim Gendeng, uh, a former member representing Barkin Ladi, Riyom, federal constituency of Plateau State. It's also a pleasure to welcome you. Good morning, good viewers. Morning, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Claire. Yes, all right. Uh, let, let, let's start with. Um, uh, let me start with the Honourable, the, the, the former member uh, representing Barkin Ladi, uh, Riyom Federal Constituency. Uh, since uh, the return to democracy in 1999, we've had a number of constitutional amendments. And I'd like us to understand, you know, what the amendment series, you know, uh, the impact of the amendment series on our democratic process. And, and, and I'm wondering, uh, because we've had five constitutional amendments or fifth alteration, if you may, mm -hmm. and we're about to have the sixth one. So what does this, the frequency of these amendments, how does it impact on the quality of our laws and our democratic process? Uh, good morning, Nigerians. I'm still Peter Ibrahim Yendeng, the former member representing Berkeley Federal Constituency from Plateau State. Uh, 
the effect of uh, amendments all these years have helped a lot in improving the democracy in the democratic system of the governance but with a lot of challenges especially the last one you could remember the inconsistencies of uh, judgment we had in the last 2020 election which have affected most of the members and even electorates negatively so the coming amendment will address a lot of issues burning issues that are, have affected people negatively i think that will help a lot if it comes but then how, how many okay just before i i'll have a follow-up uh, for you but um let's also welcome here in the studio honorable benny la uh, former member of the house of representatives uh, who represented Langtang north and South Federal Constituency of Plateau State. Thank it's you a pleasure much. to have you in the studio. Thank you. Good morning, Nigeria. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, you yeah. said it will address a lot of issues in the yeah. country, and I wonder how many, how much of it, because um, there are the itemized, uh, the issues itemized may not uh, do so much, as much as you sound it. Well, you, you, you could remember what happened last year, and to, uh, towards the end of, uh, middle of this year at the Court of Appeal where judgment were judgments were inconsistency were inconsistent rather mm -hmm. uh, in the same case like that of Plato a pre-election matter was uh, nullified based on reasons we don't know and on the same Court of Appeal again issue of Bonnie a Bonnie state and a Benway so on a pre-election matter they got their judgment so those are the issues that need to be addressed. Even our governor from Plateau lost at the Court of Appeal because of a pre-election matter. Going to Supreme Court, he got his judgment. And you find out that if our cases went beyond went the Court of Appeal, would have gotten our judgment, I would have been in office now. So what happened to us? Because based on the judgment of the Supreme Court, it clearly stated that the, the uh, Appeal Court, even the High Court in Jaws, have no jurisdiction to entertain that ca those cases. So in that miscarriage of judgment, what happened to those that have lost at the appeal court? Well, I in any case, I I'm not sure that that's um, all what we'll be going into this morning. But, but let me ask uh, Professor Ezilo, who is um, the, the constitutional um, lawyer here, do you think that a constitutional amendment can take care of issues um, concerning the involvement of the courts? Because when you disagree with INEC, for instance, the only way to go is to the court. Exactly. That's why we have uh, separation of powers and we have three arms of government. The le legislature, they make the law, and then uh, the, the executive implement, and then, of course, the judiciary uh, interprets the law. So if there is a, a dispute and for peaceful coexistence, you have to take it uh, to court and not the laws into your hands. But we've seen, even for the court, that the backlog of cases is also caused by huge number of election petition matters or, or election, or in party, call it even uh, political party affairs. They've taken a big chunk of judicial time. But you can't say people should do away with the, uh, you know, going to court. Mm -hmm. But it is, it, it's just a call for continual, you know, to improve, continuous improvement on the credibility of elections in Nigeria. And again, to begin to set these timelines, such as we have seen with regard to previous uh, 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 amendments of the Constitution, like in the fifth alteration, to have a timeline for filing of election petition and ending within one day. So those are important. But then it, do, it just takes care of a certain category of, of, of cases. But the overall is to address the root causes. I've been to you know, countries like studied um, electoral uh, systems in other countries of similarly fe fe running federal system. Take India, for example. If you look at election petition, they are the world largest democracy with nearly a billion people voting in election. And then the petition is 000.1% in terms of litigation. It doesn't happen because they have a system where you vote, electronic voting machine, I've seen that demonstrated, I've been to the Electoral Commission of India, and then they verify, and everything is 
scared to people. In fact, even when they distribute materials, there is no interest. You see the election drag for one month. People can drop things by camel to the hinterland. Nobody have that. There is no that culture of manipulation, of trying to hijack, of trying to alter. So it is about attitude. The do or die politics we are playing, the political terrain, the fact that it has also become also the easiest access to, 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 to means of production and also to wealth. So we have to look at that. But then a constitutional amendment is beyond that. But we have to tackle the root causes. And I'm worried as a lawyer, as a senior advocate, about delays, even in the appellate court. Because these cases have to drag, like the right honorable described to the from uh, high court, you know, up to the Supreme Court. And by the time, you know, some of them get, especially pre-election matters, some are already overtaken by by events, you know. So we, it's really a need for, we, we, they have to be a decisive action. Yeah. And I think going forward, we might also have a permanent court for, for taking electoral matters, Professor, since that is already we are already <laughs> delving into, into, into the, the, the crux of our conversation. Uh, I wanted to, to lay a foundation so that we can understand why you know, these amendments are necessary. Uh, I wanted to connect amendments and the quality of our democracy. And I'm glad, uh, 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 Ben and Law, you, you're able to join us for this conversation. So we've been able to establish, Prof and, and Honorable Peter, you know, have been able to establish, yes, amendments can confer some form of consistency and stability, you know, and, and all that. But again, if you consider the fact that the process itself is a very rigid, you know, process and takes time, especially with our kind of constitution, the frequency of it since 1999, what has it done to our democracy and public confidence in our laws? Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just want to go over. Thank you for having me yeah. once more and good morning, everybody. I want to, first of all, um, go back to the definition of a constitution. What is a constitution? A constitution is a document uh, in some countries, such as ours, is written that contains a set of principles that defines um, governance or defines, you know, sets of principles that defines how countries are governed. Um, <clears throat> now, in Nigeria, we have a written constitution and the constitution in section 9 provides that um, there, sh there can be an amendment of that constitution, meaning if those sets of principles or the laws governing the land uh, because it's the grand norm of the land, that's the supreme law of the land and every other law derives its power from the constitution. So if that set of principles or, or, or the law or document isn't working, then Nigerians, the nation can go back and amend it. And so we're in section nine gives um, the responsibility to the National Assembly, the Senate and the House of Reps, two thirds of which must uh, get, the cons okay. get any amendment passed, any alteration before it goes to the state houses of assembly. Now, <clears throat> Having said that, it's important to note that um, this constitution was handed down by the military. So Nigerians don't feel a form of ownership. And that is why I've been privileged to be in the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and part a little bit of the 10th assembly until we were unceremoniously removed. Um, Nigerians have, over the years, um, through the National Assembly, actually effected very, very good proposed amendments. We've worked on bills. We have, uh, you know, the issue of local government autonomy, the issue of uh, indigenship and citizenship, the rights of women, um, the rights of uh, women, for instance, who, you know, have uh, foreign husbands, uh, women desire, and uh, the, you know, we have proposed bills that women get 35% or even more, but all of these haven't come up. And um, a lot of times, you find that uh, National Assembly, sometimes they do not vote for issues that are burning issues. It's for instance, the issue of women. That has been in the front burner. And we know that Nigeria has the lowest rate of women probably in Africa and part of the lowest in the world. 97% of the National Assembly is made up of men. We have 469 seats and women are only 20. 
before I was removed unceremoniously were 21. So I was affected. I was the only woman affected and removed through a court process that was invalid in the first place. So um, it's, um, the issue of women needs to be addressed in this constitution. Um, the issue of uh, security, uh, state policing, and I'm glad it seems, uh, you know, that it, it seems that both the National Assembly and the Executive will, will, will do this. Now, the National Assembly has to be in synergy with the Executive because if the National Assembly proposes and, and even, you know, passes these amendments and the Executive doesn't sign it, like what happened during the Buhari era, you know, most of the bills were not signed, then it, it becomes a wasted effort. Uh, and so we're hoping that as Nigerians, through their legislators, Nigerians should participate in this process because this is the chance to change even the um, part of the constitution that talks about uh, elections. Should appeals stop at the Court of Appeal? I don't think so because the Court of Appeal has proven to fail Nigerians many times over and over. And Nigerians, the right to vote and be voted for is a key fundamental right of every Nigerian. We should not be compromised. And we've taken our time through various bodies and institutions and laws to ensure that right is protected. Why do you think, sorry, <coughs> sorry to interject, because I'm, I'm, you, you were in the last you know, uh, uh, assembly. Why do you think, as you said right, right now, that the uh, legislators rarely you know, amend issues that affect, you know, um, or that concerns the people, especially women. For instance, some of the amendments, you know, have, you know, altered the text of laws that affect maybe election matters, you know, um, uh, 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 maybe the judiciary to some extent, and even the judiciary, it's not the processes that affect the common man, uh, maybe there are some, you know, provisional, you know, seats and all that. Even the one that affects the young Nigerians, the not too young to run bill, has not so far been effective. I don't know, Professor Ezilo uh, may also want to, you know, speak on that. Well, um, the National Assembly has been coming up with bills, but I'm saying that not normally um, the presidency in the past did not... Um, Assent. Assent, Assent to it. It's okay. only the women's bill, I know, that the National Assembly didn't pass. But they have been coming up. They've been, that's what I said. They've been spending okay. a lot of time working on bills. But the, pres, uh, the presidency in the past um, did not assent to these bills. And so it made the exercise um, okay. ineffective, let me say, okay. to a large extent. Not all, all. Mm -hmm. Some bills, a few, uh, were passed, but not much. So I just want to say um, that I think if we want to transform our society and change mm -hmm. this country, we must go back to the roots, which is what she said. And what is this root? The three arms of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary must perform their roles because they all take an oath. They swear to the constitution of Nigeria to protect the rights of every Nigerian. And if you violate that right, there should be sanctions. And that takes me back to even what happened in, Pl in Plateau. There's no sanctions for, 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 for violating... Uh, uh, the rule of law. So judges who are, there's really not much sanctions for them provided in the NGC. So we need to go back to a situation where um, even in this constitutional process, as legislators take their time painstakingly to ensure that Nigerians address these issues, uh, issues of um, you know, fed, uh, devolution of powers. The dev most states are asking that more powers, Nigerians are asking that more powers be transferred to the states and not remain at the, federate, at the federal government because, for instance, and then issues of resource control as well. Uh, you know, the federal governments get about 52% of the consolidated revenue fund and the states only get about 26% and the local government. Uh, and then we need the full independence of the local government. Okay. Um, and, you know, we need a lot to make this country run. But like I always say, Nigeria, you may have the laws, but sometimes it's the mindset. Nigerians sometimes <laughs> do not. <laughs> I, I, I'm just wondering, you see, sometimes, isn't it the case that sometimes the demands in terms of constitution uh, amendment uh, may be unrealistic, uh, and then in some other cases, the rigidity of our amendment process make them very, very difficult. For instance, the women's uh, bill, the, the bill concerning 
women and all of those. I had privilege of engaging with a few members. They would tell you, look, am I going to vacate my seat for a woman to take it over? That's one concern. And then if you say, okay, let's make them extra slots, yes. which was what was proposed. Yes, special seats. At a time when we say, well, cost of governance is high, is it realistic to you know, further bloat the legislature? I'm just it's, asking. I'm asking the question it's, that it's, Nigerians it's, it's like, will usually ask. I think it's, it's lack of understanding, and it's most unfortunate that those gender related or specific bills were rejected. And there were about five of them, but three really speak directly to women issues in terms of affirmative action, in terms of political appointment as ministers, uh, commissioners, which was even a part three. You know, when you look at even the, the, the percentage was 10%. And then they talk about 35% in terms of party executive, which I don't even think should find its way in the constitution, mm -hmm. wasn't an issue. And, and then the main one, uh, with additional seats in parliament uh, is the main one but was largely misunderstood because first it wasn't even to take effect in uh, 2024 because I was also involved in the process as a consultant uh, to National Assembly House of Reps. It wasn't to take effect in this, I mean 2023 election. It was to take effect in 2027 election and it's about inclusion. So inclusion will always cost money. And if you want to make, because democracy, women have a right to participate in the government of their country. So also youth and other people with disability. You, once you're a Nigerian citizen, law abiding, not in conflict with the law or, or convicted, you have a right, right to vote or be voted for. Mm -hmm. And if you find that consistently a particular gender has been so marginalized, look at what we have. We've regressed without having a word. At National Assembly now, it's 3% of Senate seats occupied by women. Male 3%. This man. I, I'm sorry, in, but in, the Constitution in, in doesn't in bar of, women from con no, contesting. No, 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 no. You have to look at... It's democracy. You have to look at systemic gender discrimination against women, mm -hmm. especially in the political sphere. Mm -hmm. Where the power is, women are not. Mm -hmm. And we know why. So if you look at both sociocultural factors, if you look at also the money, why also women fail in their political enterprise or inter is also they don't have the money, mm -hmm. the funding, mm -hmm. the means of production. Access to that means of production that will enable you to compete is not there. But let me tell you, of the strongest one is issue of culture. Because the perception or the conceptualized dichotomy of public and private spheres, you know, you remember the other room. Huh? Women belong to the other room, <laughs> and women belong in domestic sphere, and women shouldn't be seen in public. All of this really affects mindset of people. When you think of who is to be a leader, who should be voted for. So we have 3% in Senate, 4% uh, in House of Reps. Out of 990 state house of, uh, houses of assembly seats, we have only 48 women. And even in some states, over 12 states have no woman in the, in the State House of Assembly. So how can women hold themselves bound by laws made by <laughs> such bodies? Uh, I've been part of making of constitutions of other countries, especially emerging states mm. and democracies like Nigeria. I was part of Rwanda constitution, even including the provision that transformed to it becoming the most gender sensitive parliament. In 2001, 2000, I spent a, a lot of time in Rwanda. Mm. With the Constitution Drafting Committee, I've been involved also with National Assembly here for, for more than uh, you know, 12 years, since 2010 or so, in the Constitution process. And it's tiring to see that what ordinarily should pass, if you talk about indigenship, and you see how this is playing out, mm. and undermining the unity of this country. Every Nigerian has a right to reside in any part of Nigeria, so long as, and, and, and that's a constitutional provision. And women, the indigeneity, affect them in a particular way, even though it affects other Nigerians. Once you're living and working outside your state, <laughs> we know how it affects. So looking yeah. at all of this, women are saying, for them, their right to participate in the government of their country, there is no budget too high <laughs> to pay for that. I just, so, I, and that yeah. additional seat, will not, we've done the economics of it. Every mm. law costs money. You see, even the one we made on cyber security, and they are thinking of where do we get the funding? Mm -hmm. And you have that provision. Every piece of legislation costs money to implement. Professor, and you have to weigh uh, the Professor, advantages. 
And that inclusion, feeling of being part of the system in Nigeria, and making people feel happy, that unmet justice need, can also fuel all kinds of conflict we see. Professor, Professor Zillow, thank you. The, the, the issues, you know, you've all raised, and just, just to clarify, that uh, this program is not gender bias. <laughs> it's, uh, so so that, let's not go all about gender. We're just looking at, you know, the Constitution Amendment, and then we'll come and look at the some of the issues up for amendment uh, in the sixth uh, alteration. But again, the issues that uh, uh, Honorable Benny Lau and Prof uh, you know, have raised, you know, touch on the effectiveness of the amendment. And that's why I'm also asking, previous amendments, how effective have they been in addressing the issues for which they were amended? Let's, and I gave an example. Let's take the not too young to run bill, for instance. Let's also take, take the amendments on the uh, electoral process, for instance. I mean, people still find ways to circumvent this, these laws. Honorable mm -hmm. Peter. Uh, let me briefly mm. add what she said about gender. Uh, in as much as you talk about culture, you've forgotten about religion. Exactly. It plays a very key role sure. in affecting, what, uh, affecting women, women in uh, politics. Mm -hmm. So to address the issue of uh, amendment, I think effectiveness. the effectiveness of amendment I think we, we need to start with ourselves. Most of the times it happens that people read, you will sit down, maybe the National Assembly will sit down and amend laws based on uh, the necessity of uh, the amendment. The judges too will read differently, to interp they will interpret it differently to suit their own uh, thinking. Looking at what uh, happened in, uh, the, in, in, in the Court of Appeal, or starting from even the tribunal in, in our state, two set of tribunals came one tribunal, but the two different uh, set, batch A and B, they, anybody that was under that uh, the, the batch A tribunal, they lost their cases. Mm -hmm. On the same issue, mm -hmm. those at the, the batch B won their cases. Coming to court of appeal, the same court of appeal dealt with all the cases as uh, post-election matters. But all these cases were pre-election matters. Mm -hmm. So reading meanings or uh, understanding the amendment properly and put, uh, addressing it properly will help in the effectiveness of the, the, the amendment. But if we don't do that, and if judges and any other person that interpret the law did not do what they're supposed to do, what happened to him? They are allowed to go scot-free. So for it to be effective, people must be punished in erring what is supposed to be, to be right. Because a lot of people have suffered unjustly based on this judgment, uh, or uh, the, their judgment. So I'm saying here that we must allow the system to work properly. Go to Niger here. You cannot drive and pass, uh, police will not stop you. You must stop and go and meet them there, or their, uh, their military, or security men. But here you will see a police officer, stop, stop, stop. Somebody will find it difficult to even stop for the policeman to check on him. So we must uh, allow the system to work. Whoever breach or go against the law, what happens to him? must be punished. People are being killed here and there. A governor of a state cannot even direct the police uh, commissioner to go and uh, uh, do something unless he got directed from the national, uh, national headquarters. So the effectiveness of the amendment must be seen to be effective by all of us obeying what is supposed to be done. Mm. So I think... Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still going back to mm. this Not Too Young to Run Act yeah. because it, it, was, it was a landmark you know, uh, yes, you know, for Nigerian youth in terms of political participation. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, elections have come and gone, mm -hmm. and the youth are still crying. Mm -hmm. it, 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 Professor Ezilo, yeah. you, you, you want to weigh in on this? It's about I I implementation. Even it passed outside the constitutional amendment, people were very happy about, mm -hmm. about that uh, bill passing. Uh, but then actualization, and that reminds us about the, about the gulf or sometimes the disparity between law, law in the books, the jury, and law in action. Um, but again, it is for not just uh, for political parties because sometimes we push so hard to get a bill passed into law. And then after that, you see there is, we be, people become fragmented. There is not that focus again for actual 
implementation yes. of that law. And that is where the problem is. And you find that even with the political parties, I'll tell you, constitutional amendment and even in legislative um, uh, work and amendment has become very politicized. Mm -hmm. Even with the politics of it that you can amend like local government autonomy, uh, mm -hmm. which ordinarily you would think that people will pass in the state exactly. house of and they will reject it. Yeah. Is it not political? Mm -hmm. Because the way, like you mentioned, the rigidity of even the amendment that require two thirds of all the states of the federation, but you would think that this should be popular. And the whole, entire Nigerians are saying, let your local government be autonomy, autonomous. And people say, let the judiciary be, uh, you know, have actual independence. Let's have, let's separate the office of the attorney general from the, from the minister of justice. And you see that, and then it wouldn't go. It depends on disparate interests of people of individuals who have political powers, who have also personalized those political powers, who think about self, self all the time. And that's what we've seen in not just making laws, but also in giving assent to those laws. Because the 20, I think 12 amendment will have been a watershed in the history of constitutional amendment in this country. Mm -hmm. And will have put a big stop because that will have required mm -hmm. even the people of Nigeria to be able to really participate actually in that in those amendments that would have been the last time a president will give assent to any constitutional amendment it would have been taken to Thank the you. people for people to vote for it and we don't have that you know yet and that's part of the problem and a lot, whole lot of politics that um, we thought and we got it wrong because since this constitution was handed down by the military one would have thought that people who have fought so hard for democracy immediately at the onset of that democracy in 1999 could have taken immediate action to, to strengthen and tie all loose ends and ensure that that democratic culture is built, that that rule of law, that constitution is. But no, because we are so selfish. Nigerians think self. An average political person thinks self. And they think self and their survival and their sustenance in the office and their, you know, they will become the power. And that power personality doesn't allow for institution building, doesn't allow for the kind of effectiveness we want to see with the some law. And some, mind you also, it was about election time. So they will pass that law to maybe the agitations mm -hmm. of youth. You quieting them. Then you've given them something. Then they are happy. And then for the youth themselves, what extent are you pushing to make sure these laws are given meaning to? Yes, they will also tell you nobody stops them from voting, at least the age uh, the age uh, prescription has been brought down and they can run for many of offices. But we know the reality. And no, why, all that, right. why they can't succeed. Th mm. th thank you, Professor Zillow. You have uh, uh, said some of the things I alluded to earlier, and I'm talking about, in part, rigidity of the process for those that are realistic that you can achieve. And some are just plain unrealistic. For instance, what will change if you say in the last one, two, three amendments, that you've talked about things like uh, they are recurring uh, local government autonomy, you talk about mm -hmm. judicial uh, autonomy and all the likes. Why don't they succeed? Because you need the states to support mm -hmm. so that they can pass. Now, Honorable Benny Lam, what, what will change to make some of these things pass? I give you an instance. State policing appears to be mm -hmm. on the front burner at this time. Mm -hmm. When the House of Representatives organized the dialogue recently, I'm not sure that there was a single governor in that dialogue, not one. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if there's any who was there or represented at all. So does that show support for it? The police said Nigeria wasn't ready, even though they later you know, withdrew the statement, but they have said it, that's what it is. Nigeria is not ready from the police perspective, so they're also not in support. How do you intend to get this passed? Well, let me just say first, let's go to the issue of the rigidity. Uh, the, rigi the rigidity for amending the constitution is there for a reason and it's done that way so that it's not passed like any ordinary no. bill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For an ordinary bill you just need a simple majority. Mm -hmm. uh, but to pass something as important uh, and as uh, crucial to the country as a constitution, definitely the two-thirds, I think uh, that means it's an overwhelming majority. Um, in terms of uh, creation of states and, uh, you know, amending uh, the constitution on the issue of creation of states and boundaries and so on, it's four-fifths, which is even more difficult. Mm -hmm. So that's why you hardly see anybody going there. Um, now, the issue of two-thirds is realizable where there's political will. It, it has been done, and it's possible. I, I just want to say that uh, the issue of state police is something all Nigerians 
uh, most Nigerians rather are in support of, and I believe most governors, if not all, are in support of it too. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that they were not at that dialogue doesn't mean they won't host it to their states because I'm sure they're waiting for it to come to their states. It was such a coincidence that all of them... It, it, it will be to their advantage. So I'm sure in their states, uh, when it comes to their states, they will be the one hosting uh, most of these, uh, you know, the processes. So and I'm sure... Welcome. Yes, they will show. Yeah. Yes, they will. They will show their support at the state level. Uh, I think it's crucial that as a nation we have. There's a national consensus on issues. Uh, we all agree that without state police, for instance, we, <laughs> some of us in some areas uh, in the north central, we're we're getting killed by the day, and the federal government cannot come from Abuja and deploy enough police. And like my colleague has said, the governor doesn't have control over the security in his state. So how are we going to go over this? You know, we need state police for community policing and for our own security. The life of every Nigerian is important and is guaranteed by the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The life that is the responsibility of the states to protect the lives and properties of every citizen. Mm -hmm. And right now that isn't being done. So we need to employ a new strategy, and that would be through state policing. So I'm almost uh, very sure that uh, unless something happens, I believe that we'll see a lot of changes this time. I have a lot of confidence in the process. Y you guys are very concerned, I'm sorry to say, concerned about the involvement of the judiciary in all of this. What do you think can be inserted into the Constitution or taken out? that we make this possible, less involvement of the judiciary. Like I said earlier, if there is a dispute, you don't trust INEC, INEC delivers you know, its verdict, and you say, no, I don't agree. There's only one way to go, you go to the court. So how do you think you can improve the integrity of the process and get the courts less involved? What is there to insert, for instance? Well, uh, first I want to say there's no way you can get the courts less involved because the constitution has given them that role to settle disputes. Um, but they're supposed to do it, um, you know, there's a rule of law and they're supposed, they took an oath, like I said, to... Morality. Yes. No, not just morality. They took an oath. Well, a lot of it is morality. <laughs> they took an oath to, <clears throat> um, to, to make their rulings in consonance with the constitution uh, of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Every public officer takes an oath um, that whatever decisions or actions they take will be in line with the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now, I believe that because of what has been happening uh, in certain courts, especially the lower courts, there should be a right to judicial review because even in America, the Supreme Court has the right to judicial review. So I think it's very important that in election petitions, there's a right to judicial review by the Supreme Court. Okay. Otherwise, we may not go very far. We will keep, other Nigerians will be victims of what we have been victims of. We've been victims of injustice, and many other Nigerians will keep suffering this. You, uh, you talked about the non, you're not too young to run bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, most of those affected in Plateau State, 24 constituencies, most of them were, were young people who had contested for the first time. And after six, I mean, less than six months in office, about four to five months, they were unceremoniously removed from office because of judicial manipulation. So, you know, it, regardless of who is on the ballot, uh, I don't think it's about party politics. It's just about some unfortunate incident that happened. There must be discipline in the executive, in the judiciary, and in the legislature. You know, so I, the uh, issue of morality comes in, but there has to be some disciplinary measures mm -hmm. so that it will forestall the future. So young people will get a fair share uh, of, you know, of what they deserve. You know, I, I think Nigerians would, would have a lot of confidence in, in the whole amendment process when they feel, when there's an in inclusion and, and they feel that, yes, they are seeing the impact of the, of the amendments. The, the immediate past president, just before he left, I sent it to, I think, about um, uh, 16, 16, no, 68 items. It was 68, yeah. 68 items. Yes. For the approval? Yes. 68. Yes, for the, uh, for the amendment. Mm. And they included so many, you know, items yeah. and, and all that. Now we are looking at, the Tenth Assembly will preside over another, mm -hmm. another uh, constitution. Already. 
uh, amendment. Professor, Professor, Professor Isilo, please, can you take us through what, what are these, what are the proposed, you know, areas for amendment? Mm. I, I think they've identified a lot yes. of areas of which uh, issues around devolution of power is one, state police, local government, judiciary, gender, you know, um, they are all part of uh, the, in fact, almost similar to what has happened. And they've called actually for memoranda. And people have, uh, I think for the House of Reps, they have already closed. And then for the Senate, it's till the end of May. And uh, the public, I had last time, the, the deputy speaker um, uh, who is leading uh, the, the uh, right honorable Benjamin, Benjamin Kalu, uh, already, they've already received, I, I had even over a million thousands already mm -hmm. of memoranda. So uh, how they sift through that and, and get out the you know, critical issues uh, will be <laughs> important. But Nigerians are participating. They are responding. And they hope that beyond zonal public hearings, they could take it down to their state. And beside, anyway, every local government, I mean, every uh, constituency, House of Reps, uh, Senate, have their constituency and they could actually consult their people. It's just that sometimes it's not effective and people are not engaging with their people at the, at, at, at the grassroots to make sure that what is happening at the center is also what they want. But the most interesting one to watch out for, again, will be this local government coming up again. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be either you say, let there be two tiers of government, in which case mm -hmm. you have states, just federal and federal state, state and remove the number of local government in the constitution. Or will you now have it, because it's all a bit amorphous, or will you have it at a, a, a complete three tiers, where even the election at that level will also be, uh, you know, determined uh, and wrong, because the way it is, it is that the at, at this, uh, you know, control of the state governors, but at the same time, when it comes to um, resources, they get also resources, uh, and then they have local government and state account. And there are models to look at, and we know even from uh, uh, from uh, those countries that run federalism, and federalism must also be physical federalism. Mm -hmm. For me, the evolution of power, it is so crucial, and and separation of powers, you know, is also very important to make sure. Uh, the, the, the one on judiciary is really of long overdue. The independence of judiciary uh, must be guaranteed. The impartiality, the appointment process must be sure that we, you know, one that will throw up the best of, you know, our first 11 and people with integrity, you know, that will be there because, of course, uh, Nigerians are unhappy, perception is everything, even though sometimes it is not, uh, the, 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 the corruption they allude to is not as, 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 as bad as the, the, the public things because also, because of these perceptions, um, we need now more than ever to, to reassert the independence of judiciary to ensure that persons of highest integrity are appointed, to ensure that the appointment process is transparent and is inclusive and that the public participate in that. How can the public participate? Because for the public to participate, for the whole of Nigerians, even where uh, we, we copied our constitution from, mm -hmm. there normally would be a referendum. Yes. Why are we not having doing that referendum? Yes, yeah, doing I, a referendum, mm -hmm. honorable. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me coming from what she said concerning the local government and uh, mm. the, what the president, it, it, president did before his exit. I'm coming from the State House of Assembly. The issue of local government autonomy came, came up. Uh, the government then delayed the passage till a few days to his uh, exit. And now I give the ruling party go ahead for, for them to agree that we should pass uh, the local government autonomy into law. Now, coming to the, 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 the center here, the president, the president, I don't know what happened, but truly, it was through the tail end of his uh, tenure that he passed about 48 bills, right, into law. Now, why must, it, why must you wait till towards the end of your tenure and pass the burden to another person to take? These issues should be addressed while you are in power so that you will go through the process and the next person that's taking it off cannot come and change it overnight. But if you are transferring a burden that you ran away from it, expecting that that person will now go into it immediately, it's always a problem. So I think that issue must be addressed properly. Uh, coming to, uh, sorry. Yes, I was looking at the issue of referendum. Why yes. are we not conducting a referendum to get the buy-in of the people in any uh, constitutional amendment? Oh, well, the issue of uh, yes. referendum, I don't know what has been happening, but I think good luck Jonathan tried it, if I'm not mistaken. 
And if you look at the, the, in the state, do any bill that is going to be passed into law, there must be a referendum. You call the critical stakeholders to come and sit down and disagree and agree on it before we pass it into law. The moment you pass it into law, it's now left for the government to assent to it or the, 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 the president to assent to it. Now, if that issue is not properly addressed and people that are not deeply involved, you find that they will kick it against it. So I want to agree that the issue of referendum, people must be involved deeply because they are the, one, the, ones, the ones that have been affected by the laws. A common man is the one that is being affected. So if this issue are addressed properly, I think we'll get to a headway on it. So I'm on an agreement that people must be involved in the referendum of whatever law want to pass in uh, yeah, case uh, issue want to pass into law. But, but are the people not involved though because um, e each time you call for uh, public hearings on every law and the people get involved. Uh, no, but so is it taken that's on board? different? No, no, no. Yes, it's different, it's different. a bit also because referendum from legislative is a referendum where yes. people vote. Yes. And you can see that happening in, in, in states of America where exactly. people they have mm -hmm. a vote to whether to vote for abortion for vote for this type of bill. And that's really the participation of mm. people in democracy. And that's what is desirable. And that's what will have happened, like you mentioned, mm. under uh, uh, Jonathan Goodluck Jonathan, mm. the constitutional amendment mm. then was uh, the one in 2014 for him to sign mm -hmm. contain that referendum yes. for future. Mm -hmm. If he had signed that, for future constitutional amendment, it will have been put to vote so that Nigerians will have voted on it and it will be conducted by an and You know, mm -hmm. just like we vote for things and, and maybe even alongside if no more voting for an election, we will have that as but well. I, I'm to just, I'm just and that would have been nice because people need to participate because they will take ownership of those laws, including mm -hmm. for implementation. Let me exactly. answer. There was a time I, we did the voice uh, properly with regard to constitution and people's participation. And we get to some marketplaces. You're asking people about constitution of Nigeria. Do you know when constitution was passed? Some will be telling you 1960 constitution. Mm -hmm. I did this yeah. like it. 2002 or three. That what resonates with the people. with people, because it was an independent constitution. It was negotiated. People who were a bit literate were aware of it. So we need to make sure that the, the common men and women participate in the process of lawmaking. Yes, that's why they have representative. Mm -hmm. But we know that that uh, constituency engagement it, or citizency engagement has not taken root. But Nigeria, what are the, the guarantees? What are the guarantees? If we conduct every election that is conducted in this country leads all the other people who didn't win to court. So what is the guarantee that if you conduct a referendum it will be accepted? It and no, it will it, not be manipulated? It, it, no, it, no, 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 no. It goes no. with education. Yes. Whatever the result, because it's about sensitization, yet you know, the level of ignorance and the lack of uh, you know education people are not uh, the majority of them just mind we, we're not people are not literate so maybe the understanding may be different but if these are explained and people go out to vote and they know they are voting for either state police or not i'm telling you nigerians will participate people understand even in local languages they will know whether they want it or not but the issue is yes. that at the end of the day if you take it also politics and influence of governors will come in definitely point. it will come in you, you, know, you know the issue the issue of state so police definitely now. And and ECT, religion yes. all those are fault lines always we'll impact in. on policy making in the country. But, you know, but some have Honorable Benny, okay. uh, sorry, Honorable Benny, uh, uh, the issue of state police now is, I mean, uh, there are uh, d several divides, yes. you know. Uh, the police themselves, majority of them, you know, uh, are saying, you they know. No, no, no. Professor you know, we don't know. Self preservation. We don't, we don't, I, no, no, no. You, are, you are the one saying that. They have not said that. They, have, they, are, they are saying, look, Nigeria is not ready. On the other divide, you know, the people, some people are saying, so with the issue of state police, don't you think that there will be need for a referendum? And why? Is there any constitutional provision that is preventing? you know, a referendum from being conducted during amendment. Uh, okay. Let me just say this. Um, the reason why you have representatives is because they speak on behalf of the, of the people. Yeah. But you just, but a you referendum, just, just like you've said, is yes. a very cumbersome process. And so we do not encourage a referendum unless it's in um, cases such as creation of states or something very key. Because just like you said, how are you going to go around the whole country? Issues of politics will come in. It makes it more cumbersome. That is why you have and elected representatives. So your representative will now vote for or against state police. 
And whatever the issues are discussed with your representative, your representative is to speak on behalf of the thousands or millions of uh, constituents that, that voted for him. And so the representative at this period is to go back to the constituency, consult with the constituency on these amendments, get the position of the constituency, and then when it comes, uh, it will be contained in the report when it comes to voting. I mean, the, con the uh, representative will submit a report from the public um, hearings held in the constituency. The 360 constituencies are supposed to hold public hearings, but a lot of times we now they make it zonal hearings. So at the various zonal levels, you make your voice heard. And you say, look, we want, to, and this works. Even in the last assembly, the zonal hearing was held in Chos. People from Nasara, from Benue, you were in the House of Assembly then. And they all came and said, this is what we want. And we took note of it. And uh, we want social amendment and social matter. We want social, the people were there and the representatives were there. The traditional rulers sent representatives, religious leaders, uh, government officials, women uh, groups, the various groups were there and represented. So uh, the public hearings uh, are a form of a referendum. It's supposed to make it less cumbersome. So once you go through that public hearing, whatever comes out of the public hearing uh, is what the National Assembly will, you know, will work on and then bring it to votes uh, and so present it for votes. And so hopefully the issue of state police will be voted for. These decisions are being influenced by the government in power. Yes, right. So and if, so if we, if it doesn't we, matter if, if it's a referendum yes. or it's a public hearing. So those are issues that need to be addressed. A referendum should be the reflection of what the people wants, want, not what the government in power wants. So it, those issues must be addressed so that people must be well represented. Yes, I am representing a constituency. At times, it's not what my constituency wants that I will say. Is what the government or my government that is in power then will influence my decision at that point. Mm -hmm. So what do we do to get it right? Influence must be taken away from whatever decision we will take. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue of uh, party politics too, uh, this thing will affect our party, will affect this, will affect that, mm -hmm. comes to play into uh, uh, whatever decision we take then. So my issue is interference must be removed out of whatever referendum we have. So and we've, we've right. even seen a situation where <laughs> uh, people have come out to disown their own representative. Exactly. Of course. <laughs> well, 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 there, there's, 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 there's a lot, they want. <laughs> there's, there's a lot yeah, to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Constituency yeah. accountability. Yeah. Yeah. Because your people cannot be saying they want this <laughs> and then you will be going to say they want <laughs> this. But that's the truth. So, <laughs> in, in other places, in fact, I've, I've, I've done, I've done uh, you know, um, you know, uh, study tours of, of some parliament, in, including US Congress. If you meet some of them, they will tell you, I vote based on what my legislative staff are advised mm. because they will have taken the temperature, they will have taken audit from Major. their constituency mm. to know what the constituency want. Otherwise, it will cost them. It, it it's works, very costly it in for clients. you to go and obviously, <laughs> I agree, but yeah. we have to start building that democratic culture. Yeah. Indeed. You know, we can't just say things will continue the way it is. Well, well, there must be, we say. must, the people and the electorate should wield the final accountability stake. I, I agree with you, but we need to work out modalities, how this is going to work. Welcome back, and you're watching Good Morning Nigeria. We're discussing constitution amendment and, of course, the process and all of that. And we have all our guests right here in the studio. Uh, and um, just before uh, we went on break, of course, we were talking about, you know, um, uh, the possibility of involving a referendum uh, in the, the whole process, and of course, everyone has shared their views. And and, I, and I'm asking uh, again. Let me come back to um, Professor Iz Izilu. Uh, the Honourable Benny Lat talked about representatives, people. You know, I mean, um, legislators being the people's representatives and the mouthpiece. Yeah. You know, as far as amendment, mm -hmm. uh, constitutional amendment is concerned, I, I, and I'm like, okay. A particular state in this country turned down, you know, uh, the proposition for uh, local government autonomy. Now, is that the people's will? <laughs> Definitely not. We know what uh, moves people, stomach infrastructure and self-preservation. <laughs> so we are, we are people, they think, but it's most unfortunate. It's actually not a laughing matter because ordinarily, 
everything should be constituency driven and it's to avoid the cumbersome of going to the people each time to say what is their view or take a referendum mm -hmm. that you have representative. And actually the legislative arm of the government is a bridge between the government and the people. So you will expect them to be the first buffer in terms of protecting the interests of the people because they are the ones that work with their constituency and know where, where it pinches them and how any particular law will affect them. But does it happen? Because you look at some of the laws that come and you know Nigerians are screaming and saying, why should I pay this? And you now say, have the legislature um, looked at this and think in best interest of their people? The answer would be definitely no. Because it's a resounding no. If they do, they will interrogate some of the laws. They will see the ones that will bring, uh, become burdensome for the government or even the one in oversight that the government also may not be able to implement or that will bring hardship to the people or may even make this law, reauthorization of that law in a few years' time, including also postponing enforcement in one year time. It's only in Nigeria you see some of the laws, except where it's necessary because of exigency of time. There are certain laws you don't make and say, in two weeks' time, the law is passed today. Mm -hmm. Two weeks, people are to pay this. I mean, it, it shouldn't happen. But this is where we are. And unfortunately, I think the legislative arm, and this is because of undue influence of executive, the executive power, which is so powerful, that they have not, you know, kind of developed, you know, as it, they should be. And we are Nigerians. That's why at times you see they get the heat from Nigerians, because Nigerians are expecting them to really speak on their behalf, to be truly their representative. But I think there is a solution to that. If people, and that's where everything comes back to credible election, uh, you know, process, if a legislature is not effective and is not representing you and your interests, then in the next periodic election, you get the person out. The report card will speak for itself. The scorecard will speak for it. There are those who are there. We know, uh, uh, right on a like how effective she was there. There is nobody from a uh, plateau state who will not be proud that she effectively represented them. And that's why they keep reaffirming you know, her and, 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 and re-electing her. And you can see even, I knew her, I'm not, it's not from my state, from the work she was doing. And we got involved and she's always accessible, whether as a human rights committee chair, whether as for all the other positions she had held you know, within her time. As, as, and that's what it should be. Uh, but for some people, they may not have that you know, capacity that even that reach, and they will not even want to consult their people. And I think, first of all, they must all have very effective constituency offices, and they must go mm -hmm. periodically back to those constituency offices because some of them don't have, and they have it in town. You can't be in a local representing local <laughs> government, and you have your constituency <laughs> office in a city. Because if you can't go back to those people, then there is a problem. And that's why I think the convergence or there is preponderance of support for even state police. That where you're having also um, huge, powerful voices of gladiators is also amongst political elite. Some will say, oh, if you have it, we can't go back to our state. The governors might just even order us, <laughs> even their deportation or expulsion or, or, or not being able to come because, but I think people should not even be afraid of that. You know what? I said we have not been able to use law effectively because if you have a law that stipulates a model, even for that state police, it may, shouldn't be in one fell swoop. There should be benchmarks, you know, guidelines, and any state meeting of these guidelines, then you can have your state police. You must have a law that totally will comply even with the independent of whoever is going to be the state commissioner of police. Tenured office work in this way, professionals, recruitment spelled out, you will find that the hands of governors are tied. The funding, how it has to be direct, and I mean consolidated without mm. any, once you set that up, hands of governors are tied. And anybody that abuse it, even as a governor, it might be also a distance for waiver of your immunity and calling for hmm. action the, for federal right. interference. So we, can, we haven't to used okay. innovative ways and our laws to tighten this. Put me on that draft just, committee. Just I will draft moment. a law that no state governor just, will violate and get away no, with it. We, we, as we, our have, state police is we, we seem to have most of the issues that have been raised so far appear to be governance issues, purely <laughs> governance issues. Yeah, and then that's... some have pushed for us to revert to the parliamentary system of government. 
And then um, when people said, oh, we've tried it before, I said, no, it doesn't have to be the British style, the Canadian style. These are different styles. It can be a hybrid. System. By the way, we can have a tailor-made um, parliamentary system of government suitable for us and our peculiarities. What do you say to that, Honorable Benila? Do well, the people you. even understand what that means? The people that are going to... Because you know, that would mean that, you know, whoever leads government will be there in parliament answering to his or her policies and, uh, you know, be able to tag people along and then the question, question time and all of those. So how does that work? Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to say that uh, um, the American presidential system um, seeks to have, like you know, the Senate, two houses of assembly. And there's a reason for that. The reason it be is because um, it's believed that the House of Reps will have the broader representation of the people. And then the Senate, we have three, three per state. Um, representation is very important. And if we are clearly spelling out that there are three arms of government, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, and we want them to perform their functions um, very effectively, I think um, mixing up the functions of a parliamentary system and an executive in one house may be a little bit too much. Um, because being a parliamentarian and at the same time being in the executive, I don't think it will make uh, that parliamentarian a very effective executive. I think it's better the executives, the parliament holds the executive accountable to their actions. Every action they take, they take. Now, I think that's where Nigerians are sort of clamoring for a new system. I think that's the problem we have with the country. When the systems don't work, we should go back and make it work and not seek to switch to another system. The presidential system, to me, by far, remains the most desirable for this nation uh, because of the reasons I've outlined. But that it's expensive. It's expensive because, number one, look at the population. It's all our problems. It's, mm -hmm. it's, because we, it's because we are not, just like everybody here has alluded to, we are not implementing it the way it should be. The laws, the judges are... <laughs> And are ruling not according to the law. The legislators are being influenced by the governors, so to say, or maybe whoever is at the top, depending, and uh, or party politics. Uh, and then, you know, uh, so we have to be true to ourselves. It's a matter of morality, ethics, and good conscience. Nigeria, prefer, Nigeria claims to be the most religious country in the world, both Christians and Muslims. But how is that impacting our country. I think it is left for us as Nigerians to set and raise a new standard and a new bar. And we must hold people accountable. There's not enough accountability. Judges are not held accountable. The executive, governors, um, commissioners, local government chairmen, legislators, everybody who has public office should be held accountable. And there has to be a system of check and balance. So what? Why the American presidential system is working and in other countries is because of accountability. Look at President Trump. President Trump is in court today. Can that happen in Nigeria? A former president? His son so, as well. Exactly, and his yeah. son. Yeah. <laughs> so, because nobody is above the rule of law. And when they say nobody is above the rule of and law, absolutely nobody. Not to be president yes, mm -hmm. and I remember when uh, I lived in America, I had so many American friends. And sometimes uh, you invite them to Nigeria and they come and... I remember one, on one occasion, one of them was asked to go into, uh, one of them wanted to go into a certain business, and he was told he had to drop some money before his papers come out. He said he's American. He can't do that. He's not allowed to bribe anybody anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. See, he's not in America. He's in Nigeria. And in Nigeria, that's what people do. Before you get uh, papers processed, they say, ah, drop something for the person. He left. And companies have been punished even yes. in Europe for, for yes. bribing. Yes. So okay. this is an it's so it's an issue of conscience and but morality. On the, on the, I can yes. Plays a key role. Th thank you, Honorable <coughs> Benny. Benny, you know, bringing in morality and accountability. Honorable Peter, again, it, it was it was uh, late, and and, and we got bled his soul. Uh, former President uh, Aradua and um, uh, PMB, uh, that's President Muhammadu Buhari. 
that probably had the guts to, you know, implement some of the amendment, uh, uh, you know, uh, constitutional amendments. Uh, the one under Jonathan, we all know what happened, you know, because of, uh, he said, some inconsistencies and, and, and all that. And um, uh, former President Lucia Gobasanjo couldn't, you know, scale through. So, co yes, considering the, the dynamics of, you know, the proposed contents of the proposed amendments, are you are you optimistic that this will be you know it, it will run through because uh, the legislator said they will do this in twenty four months. Do you see this you know you know being realized on, under it, this government? It is possible, but unless and until we avoid what they call corruption, mm. corruption in terms of not in terms of money alone but in terms of our dealings. We talk about local government uh, autonomy that some said no. Why did they say no? Why was local government created in the first time? It's to bring the government, governors closer to the people. In fact, at a the point, there was this uh, issue of uh, development areas uh, from local government. There were development areas that were created to bring, the go bring governors clo more closer to the people. But at the end of it all, what has been happening? Corruption has been the main issue. Where local government chairman will sit down, only comes to the office once in a month, share what is being uh, located to them, and leave. And why is the local government autonomy so hard to be implemented? The same thing, what is happening, I don't want to mention all this, but these are things that, at the end, any monthly allocation, local government chairman will sit down and share give the government what they can give them and tell them what to do with it. The local government will go and take their part and find out that at the end of the day, nothing has been done. Now, coming to the issue of uh, morality, as my mm. honorable colleague have said, issues that has to do with Nigeria as it, as it is must not be handled with kid gloves. Issues like this must be handled with all uh, manner of sincerity. The government might want to, or the president might want to, uh, uh, ensure that a constitutional amendment is being taken, uh, is being uh, done. But looking at the area he's coming from, I remember just few few days ago the issue of this uh, American security that they said they are coming to Nigeria. The government have come come out to to, to denounce it. Be military bases. Uh, yeah, the government have come out to denounce it, but. A lot of issues came up uh, because they want to punish the northerners, they want to do this, they want to, but we don't look at the, the, the importance of whatever intention has been brought to. I'm not saying they should bring, I'm in agreement on that, but whatever is coming, we should look at the, uh, look at the pros and cons of the that. Merits. And the merits and demerits, whether it's possible for us, what gains are we going to make from this? So I strongly believe that uh, the government, if it wants to do it, they will definitely do it. And I believe by the grace of God, if President uh, 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 Tinubu means wealth for Nigeria, Nigerians, he should be able to get it right this time around. Mm. Some, some of the bills proposed for amendment are usually, I don't know, uh, uh, Honorable Benila, you correct me if I'm wrong, are usually private, you know, sure. yes, you know, sponsored bills, and usually sponsored by legislators themselves. And that gives rise to perceptions that, you know, legislators too are culprit in the whole of this thing. You know, they tend to take on what, you know, will, you know, tilt in their interest and all that. And you raised an issue about the issue of the gender because it didn't favor them, you know. So that, the, the, that issue was, you know, shut down. How are we sure that, again, some issues like, you know, gender rights and all that, you know, will they, will, 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 will see the light of day? Well, legis legis legislators reflect, um, you know, they, they, they arise from whatever actions they take. Normally it's from societal um, attitudes or norms. They are part of the Nigerian society. But they sponsor the bills for so, amendments. Yes, we, the that, that is their role. Except if it's an executive bill. Yeah, that, that is the role of a legislator. Yes. Uh, because through that bill, they're trying to, um, you know, portray this is what my constituents want, want to get yeah. done. So that's their role. 
Um, I think the issue here is what you said. How do we get some very significant bills passed, like the gender bill? I think there's a lack of understanding. There's a disconnect between Nigerian men and the women. That's where it's, there's a root cause. That's true. <laughs> Nigerian men feel threatened um, by women in politics <laughs> and for all these reasons. And so when they go to the legislature, it's the same yeah. attitude. So there has to be an understanding that men and women must coexist together. Mm -hmm. But there, to are, there are he for she men, men who also support it. Oh, but yes, but, but they're not enough. And so we need more enlightenment and education. And these special seats, we're not saying, we're not going to, the women are advocating for special seats, not to threaten the system that exists, but just to add one seat. Senatorial and then one seat per senatorial zone, and there may be one for the House of Reps or so, too. Um, and this is because there's, like you said, non inclusion. And it's going to be almost very difficult for women to overcome these barriers. How will that better the life of the women? Because we, uh, we have women at the National Assembly. Even the life of the women or the life of Nigeria? No, the life of the women, because it's women's yes. rights. Yeah. You know, of course, uh, women, when they are involved in, in decision making, uh, they can be, the number is, in, let's agree, the number is so insignificant that they cannot make the desired impact. Yes, mm -hmm. as women representing a constituency, they represent both men and women and youth and every other person in that group. But when you have uh, a, a significant number, they can also, they will be able to represent the interests of women. Remember, if you give even ordinarily a money to empower a woman, it trickles down, you know, to the entire family. So it doesn't trickle in the same way <laughs> when men are involved. Uh, we know some of the women that we admired even in the legislative arm, um, in National Assembly, people like uh, Honorable Linda Ibazo uh, herself, the current minister, Nenno Keje. They had really powerful, consistent women, and they were able to make influence at the House of Reps then. Nobody could push. They are not people, not easy pushover at all. But there were also female legislators. There were also female legislators who you know? also and shut down. And in the Senate then, we used to have them, you know, like Senator. Prof, <laughs> Prof. there were also female. Chris Anyamu, Senator Chris Anyamu yes. and, and the rest Sorry, of sorry. Yeah. Yes, there were also female legislators, I just wanted to point this out, who did not believe also in the gen oh yes. sure sure no definitely because really you have to the process of socialize socialization is very important which includes the family the society the school and the way people think and perceive themselves there are women who will tell you no i don't want to aspire at things. they will even justify it reading bible or quran mm. where god wants them to be is not this place so when they are also there we've had even women who say, I don't support this bill on indigenity. I don't support this bill on affirmative action. I don't think that's what women need. I think we should solve the poverty. We should look at violence. But they don't know the interconnections and how those in, in, the well, intersections but, but, but of that. Really, how, uh, sorry, uh, unfortunately, you, we, we, we've run completely oh out of goodness. time. We, we've run completely out of time. I, I, was going to even, like I, I was going to even ask when we will have a bill that uh, tends to put a stop to the frequency of switching political parties. Oh yeah, that, that's PDP, an important the morning, one APC, as well. The night, yes. But it's never come up. Cross it will never come up there. because we have it well, already. We don't do everybody no, it, was, it was actually part of those you rejected, know? and I don't know for what reason. There was uh, a bill. It was part of one sent to the past president to sign on, which will have strengthened it because that was restricted to the parliament, also with regard to executive and some others. And I believe it's important for building a democratic, building political parties as an institution uh, and right. based on ideology. And it's a topic you can take up well, some other time. It's but something then, we'll uh, have to do some other time. For parliamentary but, systems thank you. and the costing, I think, yes, it will be cheaper. But I'm really worried at a very micro level that we are not sophisticated for that type of politics. We've been and there before, so we can be, do it again. And it's going to be very physical this oh, time all right. <laughs> Professor Joy Zilo, thank you very much. SN, uh, Emeritus uh, Dean of Law, University of Nigeria, Asuka, former Commissioner for Women Affairs and Social Development, Enugu State, and many more caps that you wear. We thank you very much. Always a pleasure having you on Good Morning thank Nigeria. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me also thank Honorable Benny La. Uh, former member of the House of Representatives, representing Langtang, North and South Federal Constituency. We thank you very much for being on the program. Thank program. you. Thank you. And then finally, Honorable Peter Ibrahim Gendeng, former member representing Barakin Ladi, Riyom, Federal Constituency of Plateau State.
It's been a pleasure having all of you, okay. um, you know, enjoy this program with us today. But that's the show. Claire? All right. Um, also, let me also appreciate all our guests and, of course, to you for watching. I am Claire Adilabu Abdul-Rezak. The program returns same time tomorrow.